through some uh, some of those challenges that we've actually faced. Um, these are real life examples that I've used in uh, a couple of other presentations before uh, of what can actually happen and what actually has happened. And the first one is um, happened last year. President Obama's military helicopter, Marine One, um, quite a secure helicopter, very sensitive data. Uh, the contractor that was working on the blueprints took the blueprints home uh, for whatever reason, put them on his home computer, and um, well, those blueprints were shared by a peer-to-peer -peer program. Just sat on the um, computer. He might have known it was on there. It might have been something loaded on by his kids, but um, whatever the outcome, uh, that peer-to-peer -peer program shared the whole of his C drive with the whole of the world, and President Obama's helicopter was compromised. Airbase in Guam, and all of these incidents that I'm going to uh, talk about now, I'm going to relate to <coughs> some of the obstacles um, later on, on, on what would have stopped someone putting controls in place to manage these. There's an airbase in Guam, um, also in the last couple of years, uh, where they had a penetration test, and for those of you not aware of penetration tests, um, that's a sort of um, annual event where you get an external security company that's got expertise and they try and break into your systems, normally using technology but sometimes using um, what's known as social engineering, trying to get vital information out of staff. Uh, what this company did, they sent an email to all the personnel on the airbase and said, um, we're going to be filming Transformers 3 here, um, do you fancy being extras? <coughs> so fill out this web page with all your details. And, and we'll also need your login for your know, systems and various other things just to verify your identity. Um, they actually had to stop the exercise because they were inundated by <laughs> responses from uh, these airmen who were quite keen to be in the film. Something that hit the news um, last year, right, uh, Iran was developing a nuclear program just to, um, allegedly just for nuclear power, um, but it got hit by a virus. And there's a very specific type of virus that was just um, designed to operate, uh, also activate, when it comes across a very specific type of um, software developed by Siemens, which is used to control industrial systems. Uh, in Iran, this virus had um, found its way onto 60% of the computers in the whole country, but it was very, very specifically targeted to stop um, the nuclear enrichment program and was quite successful in doing that. And finally, something that would have affected uh, some of the students among us, especially around exam time, so they might have found it a bit beneficial, the PlayStation Network was taken offline for 23 days. <coughs> now, this was quite a big compromise. It took, um, it took the details of 77 million accounts, uh, which is username, passwords, um, email addresses, etc. But it, of those 77 million, 12.5 million had credit card details. Now, the PlayStation Network is just a consumer facing um, front end. You normally access it by a, play, a PlayStation console. Pretty hard to get into, but because the Sony network was interconnected um, throughout the corporation and had very many um, attack vectors, somebody managed to get into that network and work its way through the network and manage to get those. Um, account details. If you think about it, 12.5 million credit card details, each one's worth about 50 cents. That's six and a half million uh, dollars. That's a, a lot, lot of money and it's worth all that effort to get in. Costs only the re uh, region of 170 million dollars in recompense and uh, lost sales. Moving closer to the home, a couple of years ago, uh, three hospitals in London were hit by the Mitob virus. This virus um, infiltrated the networks and it forced them to take down every non-essential service for two weeks. Quite a serious thing, engineers were working on it, um, around the clock to fix this virus. Um, the only things they could keep running were operating uh, theatres and um, accident and emergency and that was all due to manual backup systems that they relied on. There's a website called Zone H zone-h.org which lists website attacks and it's where if somebody's compromised a website and they want to boast about it they go and post the details on this website 
and um, for the whole world to see. Since 2004, which is where the databases start, 490.gov.uk sites have been compromised. Um, you can only get one of those sites if you're a local authority or part of national government. And over 26,000.co.uk websites, and it's increasing every year. Um, quite concerning. But what doesn't get posted on this website are the tax where um, quite malicious damage is um, made and um, data stolen. Because the ha people who do these, those sort of attacks don't really want the world to know about it, because they're making money out of it. A couple of councils last year got fined for unencrypted laptops. They're running um, an out-of-hour service, just providing uh, special care for adults, out-of-hours. The person providing the service um, was doing it from home on a council-provided laptop. And they're also providing the service for another council. Details of 1,700 people were compromised when that laptop got stolen from the employee's house. Um, both councils had procedures in place that meant all their laptops should have been encrypted. This particular laptop wasn't. There was only password protected. They had a report theft to the Information Commissioner's Office, who then um, issued fines for non-compliance with the procedures. Uh, one of the councils got fined £80,000, the other one £70,000. Um, quite considerable sums of money. And if you're driving into Crawley a few years ago, just like you're driving to most um, towns or city centres, you'll see signs that just tell you how many car parking spaces, give you tra traffic information, etc. Um, pretty innocuous uh, sort of signs. If you're driving into Crawley a few years ago, somebody actually changed the sign to read something offensive. <laughs> now, this, this service was provided by... Um, a third party outsourcer for Crawley, but the council were the ones that got all the bad publicity and somebody just got into their systems and just had a bit of malicious play. Now all of these incidents that we've seen, that we've seen here, are <coughs> unpreventable. And if, if you study the theory of um, IT security, you'll look at some of these and go, how on earth did they happen? And um, later on I'll be linking some of the obstacles back to these incidents and uh, Hopefully, give it a reason why some of them can happen. Onto the theory. There's an organisation called GovCert UK, and they're the national organisation for um, incident investigation. Based in TCHQ up in Cheltenham, uh, quite a high up, but quite a powerful government organisation. If you get an incident, a major incident that affects UK infrastructure, you'll get a phone call from them. They publish what's known as the top 10 mitigations um, each year. Most of them fairly common sense and you look at them and think, well, oh, yep, we should be um, uh, applying all those controls. Not necessarily straightforward to do so, but I'll just run through the controls pretty straightforward. First one, patch and update. A lot of the vulnerabilities, um, especially with regards to websites, are due to unpatched systems. And once a vulnerability becomes known in the wild, you can download and exploit through it. Um, there's quite a few tools you can just um, get hold of. You don't need any computer skills. It's just pressing the buttons, pressing a few buttons. They export known vulnerabilities, and you can get in and um, break into systems. Just by patching and updating regularly, stops all of that. <coughs> the next mitigation, restrict administrator privileges. This stops people loading their own software on the computers. Um, it will stop malware once it gets on the computer from creating a lot of damage and um, getting further into computer network. Fairly obvious one you would have thought, but not every um, organisation has this for various reasons. It's just run anti-malware software. Hopefully it's something that most people do here at home, but um, not always the case. If every organisation and everyone in the world ran up-to-date anti-malware software, we wouldn't see it. It just wouldn't exist. We stop fairly quickly. System lockdown of unnecessary features and applications. When you buy a computer these days, it comes with nice bundles of software, um, even built into the operating system. Uh, Microsoft Windows has things like Paint and uh, nice little calculator applications and lots of other little things that you don't necessarily need to use as part of your business. Some of these applications can have vulnerabilities. 
And the basic sort of uh, rule of thumb is if you don't need them to, as part of your business, just uninstall them from the computer. Removal media control. Removal media is one of the biggest attack vectors we've got, especially for malware. And also it causes a lot of data loss. Um, if your organisation applies me removal media control, it cuts out that attack vector and ensures you've got a much more secure system. Really tough one to do, and I'll be going into this a, a bit later. Application whitelisting. This is where, as an organisation, you have a list of all the applications that you use, what services those applications use themselves, and you implement software that ensures only those applications and those services can be run on your organisation. So if somebody brings in a piece of their own software, it just won't run. Or if there's a piece of malware that's not on that list, it won't run at all. Audit and logging. This is more of a um, reactive um, control, but if you do get an incident, you want to know how it's caused, who caused it, what um, mitigation you can apply to stop it happening again. And if um, it is a situation where something illegal has happened, you need to make sure those logs are passed on to the, um, the police or other authorities and that they are um, protected in integrity, that they can't be changed and that they can pass through the chain of custody um, and be used in the court of law as evidence um, for the crime and get the proper remediation done. Blacklisting at boundaries, this should be fairly common sense as well. That's stopping things like executables and other um, nasty files from being run on your network. It's just things like web filtering and email filters and just stopping known types of application. And the last one they say, say you should do is um, user education. And the users are your front line of defence. If they um, got a good level of awareness, they will know not to put in removal media. They will know the reason why they can't insta install their own software. And a good example why you can't, um, one I always go back to is Google Earth. Free for home use. Um, you can use it as much as you want at home for nothing. As soon as you want to use it in a, co a corporation, it's a $400 license fee. But people don't understand that because they don't tend to look at the licensing issues when you're at home. And <clears throat> not on the mitigation uh, that's put out by GovCert, but something that really we should be doing is secure application development. And that's not only if you develop your own app applications, it should be developed in a secure manner, but when you're purchasing applications, you want to see that they actually have been developed in a secure manner and you've got some certification to prove so. So if you actually applied all of those mitigations, you should be down the road to having a very secure network and should be able to stop all of the incidents that we saw beforehand um, from occurring. But in reality, it's not that easy to apply all of those controls. First um, obstacle, commercial pressures. Each organisation faces its own type of commercial pressure. Um, that's dependent on the market it's actually in and the um, economic climate at the time. Um, the commercial pressures are changing um, constantly. For example, if you're a cardboard bo box manufacturer, you're main um, objective is to get cardboard boxes out of the door. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on you to focus much of your um, business functions on just that function rather than IT security issues. Moving on to the application development side of things, there's a lot of commercial pressure on um, application developers to get their applications out to very strict and tight deadline, uh, deadlines. That's not necessarily going to be um, very good for making sure your systems are very securely developed and properly tested. And I think this um, became apparent with Microsoft in the 90s, where that they were very good at getting operating systems out and new programs out, because uh, they were in a billion dollar industry and had very strict pressures to meet these deadlines. Unfortunately, they had a test bed of millions and millions of users trying to find um, faults with their programs and vulnerabilities. And there was no way Microsoft could have done the same amount of testing in um, a short period of time and be able to release any pieces of software. 
So they were under great commercial pressure to release these, <coughs> these pieces of software and um, corners were cut, insecure applications were rolled out and a lot of people purchased them. Other commercial pressures that um, organisations face, um, if you're a supplier of applications, you'll have a, a contract um, of support and you'll need to meet specific um, service level agreements. For example, you might be uh, under a four, four hour deadline to fix a bug in that application if it's been um, identified. Now the commercial pressure you'll be on, under is to be able to have access to that, those systems 24 hours a day, all the time, and just make any changes you wish um, any time. Unfortunately, that presents a very big security risk because you can't have unknown people making unwarranted changes because you, you could quite easily see that um, if they haven't got the proper controls, um, it can affect your network. So you need to be able to control this. Moving on, business priorities. Each business has different priorities, um, and this is dependent on obviously the industry that they're in. And all of these are linked, um, and I'll, I'll, if anyone's been in one of Steve's um, lectures, Steve quite often mentions the word politics. And he doesn't mean party politics, he means office politics and just business politics. And the business priorities in an organisation are quite often defined by these. But go back to our um, cobalt box manufacturer. Their priority is making boxes as cheap as possible, as many as possible, and maximising the profit for their shareholders. Their, project ma their production manager spots a new machine that can double the output, double the amount of money they make. Their priority is going to be to buy that machine compared to buying a firewall that will protect their network for the same price. And um, when the board make the decision on where they're going to spend the money, they'll prioritise the non-security control over the security control because um, they will not see the value from um, purchasing a nice firewall until something goes wrong. And that's when they potentially re refocus their priorities and um, decide, yes, we need to put more money in security um, in order to be able to maximise our profits all the time. Linked to that is resource allocation and availability. Now, logically you think um, all your resources should be allocated according to the business priority. However, this is where politics come in. People circumvent um, processes and procedures and you could get a high ranking official coming in and saying I need such and such enabled on my um, smartphone, I want Bluetooth enabled on my smartphone so I can walk around and take um, calls um, without having to um, speak in the phone, just over a headset. Now, the person that actually has to do that, they'll be um, forced into allocating their resources into providing that non-secure control, uh, non, uh, non uh, avoiding that security control in order to appease the chief executive or the important person. Um, we're now in a situation where you can get a device, such as a removable media stick, plug it into a computer at home, take it into work, plug it into a computer at work, and um, it will connect without having to install any drivers, it'll just all work seamlessly. And the same goes with all our computer networks, we're all connected to um, networks throughout the world, and all linked up, just to facilitate working easier and um, information sharing. And this interconnectivity, this is one of the reasons why Sony um, got hacked. Because their network, their sort of consumer side of their network, which was storing all of the user accounts and um, lots of sensitive data, was linked through all their corporate networks and um, various other uncontrolled areas. And somebody was able to find a vulnerability in the per perimeter and spend months working through various sections of the network until they actually got to the payload and the sort of... Um, six million dollar uh, data that they're after. Removal media, in theory, is a very easy thing to um, block. 
you just go back to the top 10 mitigations where they say you should have removal media control. In theory, very easy to implement. You just put software on, stops um, things like USB sticks being used. In reality, it's a very, very big project. USB is used by lots of connecting peripheral devices, keyboards, mice, print printers, um, protector controls, all sorts of things use USB. To implement the proper control software on there, you've actually got to spend a lot of time going through um, with your business what they actually use um, the USB for, what they actually use removal media for. And you've, you've got to identify all of these, <coughs> put in the proper controls to actually stop um, the ones you don't want coming in working, <coughs> and um, have a very big user education program to ensure that people know why they can do these things. And that is actually a pro project for a large organisation that's going to cost tens of thousands of pounds, tens of hundreds. Um, but when you actually see it on the top ten mitigations, you think, oh, fairly easy one to implement. In reality, um, it does take a lot of resources and a lot of priority. And it's how you get that priority up. Um, the latter is a very difficult um, question. And also, once you've implemented it, there's always going to be situations where somebody will come in, for example, could be coming in to see your chief executive, with a presentation on a memory stick, plugs it in, not recognised, doesn't work, suddenly... Um, you get asked to circumvent that control. Big aspect of um, business, and it's mainly really been in the financial sector that um, risk appetite has been a focus. But ironically, I think everyone here has probably um, done a bit of risk management in your lives. If you buy insurance, that's effectively all you're doing. You're managing the risk of losing your devices or your property. Um, you're paying money and just gambling that um, you won't have to pay the full cost if you lose it. Each business has its own different risk appetite. And this depends on, um, again, the sector they're in. If you're in the financial sector, your risk appetite is going to be really low. So traditionally, they spent a lot of money on protecting um, their assets. Because if, if you're a financial institution, you get a data security breach. Um, that effectively could be then the business view. So they actually realised this for a, um, a long time ago and they've put in the proper risk management models and this is something that you'll see in a lot of organisations doing now is actually risk assessing, um, putting various controls in, sorry, sorry, putting various controls in <coughs> and do we actually get the value of doing this? And it's all about um, the amount that will actually cost that, to put that control in as the amount of money you'll save. And I'll go back to whitelisting. <coughs> the cost of whitelisting is going to be quite high. Um, the bigger the organisation, the um, more applications you're going to have. And today's modern applications, they rely on a lot of different services and other third-party applications, for example, Java or um, Adobe. They're all integrated. And you've got to identify all the different flavours and um, put them in your whitelist and um, implement software that blocks that. Now, one of the reasons many organisations don't put that mitigation in is because you can't actually see the value you'll get from doing that as opposed to other mitigations you put in, for example, locking down the PC, stopping admin access. One big area of security where um, end users get frustrated is usability. The most secure systems in the world are ones that people can't use. I remember when I was um, on Steve's course 10 years ago talking about uh, Windows NT. It actually got certified by um, an American security organisation as 100% secure. And they did the full accreditation and checks on it. But they had one um, mitigation. It's only secure if you don't connect it to anything. So effectively it became uh, useless as a networking operating system. Um, a similar thing goes for... As an organisation, the council's just implementing Windows 7, um, which is a lot better than uh, some of the systems we had before. We looked at implementing <coughs> CSG's uh, security model. CSG, they're another arm of um, GCHQ. They're, they're control, uh, concerned with um, technical controls. They don't investigate incidents, they advise on what technical controls.
controls you should implement to get, get a secure system. They're very MOD focused um, and they produce a document that um, you could configure your Windows 7 PC to be totally secure and use in your business. We got a copy of this document, took a look at it and unfortunately it just your PC didn't work. It, it, it worked, you could access some things on it, but the, app, the range of applications that you needed and services that you needed to run a business unfortunately made the system completely unusable. <coughs> and this is the sort of pay, um, the dilemma you face with uh, security all the time, is you can have something locked down so it's perfectly secure, but you can't use it. And this is the thing that frustrates end users. But you have to implement the control controls to um, a sort of... Uh, minimum level, for example, locking down admin access so people can't load their own software they're familiar with um, because of legal reasons, um, locking down certain files going on there um, because of copy potential copyright reasons. We quite often get asked, why can't I put my own music on um, the corporate <coughs> phone for me? Just want to use it as a ringtone, isn't going to um, hurt anyone. Unfortunately, once you transfer ownership from your personal device to a corporate device, um, you're actually ch changing the license terms and um, there have been organisations fined for that. There's a big company up in Scotland fined, um, fined several thousand pounds just for having um, several music files on, on the network. Finally, maturity, well, not finally, in this slide, maturity of data management. For years we gave um, people computers, here you go, used it to do your work. Didn't give them any instructions on what actually to do with the files they created or um, how they marked them, how they actually value them. <coughs> In the financial sector, they've actually been doing very clever data management for years. Because if you've got bank account details, you know exactly how much that is worth. Um, because that's the nature of the financial da data, it actually tells you how much that's worth. But most other organisations, people don't know how much their data is worth, what it actually is. And um, one of the sort of main focuses of security is you need to know what your data is worth to identify how much to spend to protect it. And one of, when I um, did a security qualification years ago, one of the sort of ethos was um, never spend more on protecting your data than it's actually worth. Um, and because we don't have um, mature data management, it's very hard to justify the expense of some of the security controls you need to implement. For example, an intrusion detection system will cost tens of thousands of pounds just to purchase. You then need a lot of resources to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis and potentially a couple of full-time people if you um, go on the aspect that it needs to be managed 24 by 7 because we work in a, a global age where in Plymouth it might be 1 o'clock on a Saturday night, nobody's around and uh, most people are asleep, but the other side of the world, um, people are going to be up potentially breaking into your network. So an intrusion detection system, you cannot justify unless you've got mature data management and know exactly what your data is worth. Another obstacle is lack of ICT security leadership and knowledge. I mean, I'm very fortunate to work for uh, an organisation that um, employs someone that, that's got a speciality in security, and um, but I know there's a lot of organisations that don't. One of my main focuses is um, when we get incidents, is going through the investigation, identifying any mitigation we need to <coughs> implement, and th this is where we can actually justify some of the controls you need to implement. If you haven't got that specialist knowledge, um, it's very hard to firstly investigate the incident and then identify any mitigations um, we need to put in place. And also, there's a big aspect of that is in the risk management side of things. You're able to identify the risks and identify the impact and the cost of the organisation of not implementing that control. Two, um, the last two are areas which are coming into focus a lot more these days. Externally hosted systems um, is commonly be being known these days as um, cloud systems. And these are systems that are hosted out. Um, outside your organisation, in some unknown data centre, could be anywhere. You're totally reliant on what the supplier, um, what controls they implement, 
how, they, how securely they've developed their application, and all of that's outside your control. Um, you can put contracts together to specify um, what controls you, you expect to see and what sort of level of security, but quite often the, the companies that are supplying these things, they don't have the specialised knowledge themselves. They're under the same commercial pressures that are identified in the, um, in the first obstacle. So they're pressurised to get a system out, lots of people are using it, you might identify there's a problem in one aspect that you're using, but they can't actually take the whole system down and fix that because they've got millions of other customers using other aspects and they're under pressure to keep it running. So it's, a, it's a very much of a, a big threat coming into organisations now, it's growing and growing. Um, and they can be purchased without any expertise in ICT at all. You can be a part of the business, see a need for a service, just go out and buy it, use it and nobody else knows. The last area, consumerisation of devices. This is going to be the threat that grows um, exponentially now. <coughs> There's big cost drivers to save um, costs and many people now are walking around with smartphones that are far more powerful than your average PC was 10 years ago. Um, anyone that's got an iPhone, they've got more storage and the corporate network I was managing before I left to do the Masters with Steve. I think on the week, week before I left to do that, I just upgraded our storage to something like 70 gigabytes. Most people's smartphones got more than that now. And they're far more powerful than their computer networks. And people want to use them. People don't want a corporate device and their own device. They want to be able to use their own personal device for email, um, look at their calendars, do a bit of work on, and with the sort of proliferation of tablets, um, iPad being a good example down in the front here, um, it's, it's far easier to walk around with a small tablet than a big laptop and do your work. Unfortunately, these devices don't have um, the same security or same controls as corporate devices. I mean, there isn't any encryption on the iPad or the iPhone. You can protect them to a certain degree. But the big problem with these consumerization of devices, you can circumvent your corporate controls very easily. You can plug them into your uh, corporate PC to charge, but it also turns that um, smartphone into an external hard drive. Unfortunately, because of the climate we're in now, there's a big drive to save costs. And if you're a manager and you've got a, a corporate phone that costs you £350 to buy, and you're paying £30 a month, and you've also got an iPhone which you're paying for yourself, you can um, put the pressure on, and people are putting the pressure on, to get rid of the corporate phones, and <clears throat> we want to use our own smartphones and work a lot smarter. Unfortunately, the <coughs> level of maturity of software to control these devices, I think there's only one at the moment that you can corporately control easily, and that's the BlackBerry. Um, there are so pieces of software for things like iPhones, etc., but we're you're sort of met by um, a whole variety of different types of devices. Uh, it's a massive cost to implement something that will control um, every single uh, flavour of smartphone or tablet you could potentially connect to your network and you uh, want, want to work with. <coughs> um, that's just some of the controls, uh, some of the obstacles to some of the controls that um, you should be implementing. Just in summary, I mean, in an ideal world, all systems that we use would, would be totally secure from risks. Um, we'd just look at every single control, we'd implement those top 10 security mitigations, we'd have an unlimited fund to put in security controls, but you've also got to realise that business is going to operate and um, there's always going to be a payoff, and there's always going to be other priorities. Unfortunately, as a business looks at it, security is just one aspect of their business, and they'll, they'll take a risk-based approach and they'll judge whether they want to spend money on um, a nice IDS system or a nice firewall or a nice new production machine to increase their profits. And it's always um, a political sort of battle, a non-party political, just an um, internal fight, 
just to try and get your priorities raised as high as they can. And there's always new risks being identified. You can't always get solutions. There isn't a, a one-fits-all solution for controlling smartphones or tablets at the moment. And these risks um, take time to mitigate and decide what proper controls we um, implement. And because of these things, we're always going to get security incidents. And we're always going to get the incidents like the eight I mentioned right at the start. Even if people have put in as much mitigation as they can, you're still going to get websites compromised because not everyone can put in every single control across the board.